main conference, uh, you know, if not counting the workshop uh, Monday and Tuesday next week. Uh, my name is Alexander Sokol. Um, I'm head of quant research at Compatible. Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce the panelists. Uh, so with us today, Igor Helperin, uh, or Galperin, uh, that's the correct way to pronounce it, uh, AI Research Associate Fidelity Investments. Uh, Marco Kangra, uh, head of quantitative research Ravenpack. Ryan Ferguson, founder and CEO Risk Fuel. David Jessup, head of investment bank Columbia Threadneedle. Arthur Sepp, director of research Quantica. And Matthew Dixon, Stewart School of Business, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology IIT. Uh, all right, so with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, so we have a long list of questions. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 this, this question, some of them are, uh, you know, the same as in the previous um, uh, conference. I think this question is always the same. The answers uh, hopefully will be will be different as we uh, you know develop uh, machine learning and quantum finance further. Uh, and uh, it, it, I would like you know like uh, in the previous panel, uh, I would like to invite everybody uh, to also submit their own questions. Uh, and this can be done through the chat. So if you have a question, uh, please go through the chat. Uh, or alternative, raise your hands on a video uh, or direct message uh, uh, you know the moderator or myself. Uh, and uh, if you prefer to ask your question uh, by voice, uh, and uh, we'll uh, unmute you. Uh, in the meantime, er everyone um, uh, who's not speaking, please uh, put on mute because a lot of people are dialing in. All right, so with that, uh, let's get started. Um, first of all, uh, you know, first question uh, is unique challenges uh, of using machine learning and finance. All right, so specifically uh, dealing with scarce and stationary data uh, and you know, best practices to overcome the challenges. Uh, machine learning, uh, generally, uh, you know, the, the, the most, you know, the tremendous success of machine learning, the, the really astonishing achievements that uh, happened in the past years, they happened uh, with data that had billions of, you know, or, or more, you know, data points, right? So, you know, these are images of faces where you can do face recognition. These are, uh, uh, you know, massive uh, amounts of data that you can uh, uh, do for language processing. In finance, uh, we don't actually have that much data, right? So either the horizons we're interested in are such that we just don't have enough data points. Or if we do have enough data points, the question is, you know, how far back you go before the data becomes irrelevant because, you know, markets change uh, as we have discovered, you know, this January as well as many times before. So uh, first question, uh, and uh, if anybody from the panel would like to take it, you know, please, please just go ahead. Uh, so, you know, dealing with scarce and non-stationary data uh, using machine learning and finance, and how do we uh, change the algorithms that have been developed for massive data sets? Basically, how do we take this from big data to little data? Okay, I, I'll, I'll start and then I will let my, my sort of fellow panelists uh, join in. Um, a very bizarre panel when you can't actually sort of sit and sort of see what they're actually saying, but never mind. Um, so, um, I mean, I think the answer is you have to, to some extent, you have to approach the problem with the model of the world in, in mind. Uh, I mean, Matthew um, sort of wrote a book where he talks about sort of part of this problem about, you know, machine learning effectively a, a doesn't have a model of the world. Um, and, and that is your problem. You know, if you don't have a model of the world, then you, as you say, you need a lot of data to um, to figure out what's going on. Um, and we don't have that. So one approach, and I'm not saying it's the only approach, um, you know, one approach is to come at it with a model of the world. So either help the model along by doing a lot of feature engineering before you, you know, so you sort of sort out the data in a more sensible way, or you know create a style of model that that sort of builds in your your views of the world even though but but could but that allows you to have that challenge you know obviously you don't want to just sort of force yourself down a single track but at the same time you don't want to just wander everywhere because you know most of the places you go are utterly pointless so th that would just be sort of a starting point and i'll just be interested to see say what my uh, my fellow panelists have to say uh, yeah, I would, I, I would, I would totally agree with David, uh, and uh, indeed, uh, I, I think that this is the answer to the at least. Uh, well, non-stationarity is a little bit different topic, but the small data is is uh, indeed the challenge in most of things that we do. <clears throat> so, uh, in, in our book, we talked about that. I also touched a little bit upon that in my presentation. 
like what are the key differences between what we do in finance versus uh, what other people do in big tech. And, um, and, and I think indeed the, 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 the best answer that I'm, I, I'm aware of is, uh, well, I, I call it for myself, I call it regularization by a theory. So basically, uh, this is something that goes like indeed the, this model of the world that you embed. Uh, when I just got familiar with machine learning, I kind of became very arrogant and my kind of initial attitude, okay, let's dismiss everything. Let's dismiss all the parametric models. Data will tell us everything. Data will not tell us anything. I mean, un unless we have a view on this, right? So, so using, uh, like why I call it uh, regularization by a model, because basically you can impose uh, like what is done, for example, in the field of scientific uh, machine learning, uh, they, they use uh, uh, machine learning to solve partial differential equations, right? So you can think of, PDEs as a, some sort of regularization of your model, right? You can in, in, enforce it on your model. It's something that goes beyond like simple-minded, like L1, L2 regularization. You can embed the whole model as your prior, right? Bayesian model can do the same things. Right, yeah, I, 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 I completely agree. I think um, uh, really, you know, just someone I know said that, uh, you know, for little data, you need shallow learning, right? So, you know, for big data, you need uh, deep learning, right? So there you need shallow learning. What it means is that uh, in uh, you know deep networks, uh, each layer is responsible for something and well-designed deep networks, right? So in the, the deep networks that work well, they're well-designed, right? They're designed for a purpose. They have architecture that is uh, fine-tuned to the purpose. And each layer is responsible for something. And each, each time you add a layer, you need more data. So I completely agree with Igor that uh, you know in finance when you have scarce data you just have to do some of the work that normally in in uh, you know big tech uh, you know big data applications uh, machine learning will do for you uh, here not because it lacks the power but just because you lack the data you have to do some of the work uh, uh, yourself and you know perhaps the network architecture is a little bit simpler so you know I, I saw some of the you know very strong results that were obtained uh, in finance with machine learning that did not use very you know deep basically multi-layer deep learning networks right so so methods that are used basically are you know pretty simple you know a couple layers per perceptrons uh, uh, even you know which is really you know very old well-known method in fact the first perceptron was actually hardware right so it was a big machine with wires right so uh, and uh, you know things like uh, the RBMs right restricted Boltzmann machines which is really you know they're very simple also and uh, well-known uh, network. So, you know, when you do deep, deep belief network, you stack RBMs, right? For finance, you just don't have the luxury because you don't have the data. So you can use uh, one, maybe two. And uh, another thing I wanted to highlight uh, is that there was a great presentation on building, um, which I think also uh, goes back to what Igor said. Uh, there's a great presentation um, that we just heard about um, uh, using uh, neural networks in which each neuron is actually a financial model, right? So in other words, uh, not um, uh, building neurons, uh, you know, from uh, regular activation functions, but making them finance specific activation function, which also does the job for the neural network and makes it easier for, 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 for that to do the rest. But overall still, uh, you know, I, I feel that machine learning is really, you know, a breakthrough technology that, you know, that uh, generally, uh, you know, for three or four decades in quant finance, all we had is NSD, or stochastic differential equation. Uh, that basically was the way to approach practically everything, uh, uh, you know, in, in our domain that normally, you know, this conference is about. Of course, there are many areas of quant finance, but if we're talking about uh, derivatives pricing, uh, you know, risk management, uh, uh, seeking alpha, right? So we're looking at stochastic differential equations. We're looking at uh, models that are based essentially on stochastic differential equation, you know, Markovitz model, portfolio theory, and so forth. So here we finally have another way, right? Which is a different way. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's very exciting uh, uh, what this can do. And I think that we're just at the beginning. I feel like we're, you know, in the 1920s when the quantum physics was just invented, right? And, you know, all of these discoveries are just about, uh, you know, to happen. So it's a very exciting time. So we I, should be very happy about that because of that, right? Yeah, we have a exactly. chance. That's right. That's right. I agree with every, everything that's been said. And um, I think in terms of uh, like dealing with scarce and non-stationary data, well, a fairly simple solution is go deal with stationary data instead. Um, like obviously um, at, at times novice machine learning practitioners tend to kind of, uh, you, you know, when you have a hammer, everything feels 
it seems like a nail <laughs> and you immediately resort to predicting price action, which is, um, well, extraordinarily difficult really. Um, in, instead, um, I view machine learning as just another tool in the tool, toolkit and each model is its own tool that's uh, I think best applied to specific use cases. So in terms of, you know, looking uh, kind of low hanging fruit, de um, dealing with uh, first st stationary data. If you were, I come from the world of fundamental investing where um, most of the time you kind of look for that intuition as to what drives price action. And more often than not, there's a fairly sophisticated model in the background, but uh, junk in, junk out is, is, is a sort of the norm. And uh, the inputs, the drivers of the model are, I think, what drive price action ultimately over the longer term, at least. Um, and uh, those drivers more often than not tend to be stationary to a large extent. And I think paying attention to um, the kind of mean reverting um, properties of many of the drivers like EBITDA margins, uh, returns on uh, invested capital, kind of looking at the base rates over what, what, what the likely range of uh, a fundamental variable or an input a driver into a model it could be over the longer term and then mean reverted and then layer some NLP um, techniques or deep learning techniques on top of it um, to, to sensitize for all of the other drivers that you can discern from big data. I think that's kind of the lower hanging fruit than um, encapsulating everything within a massive quant model that uh, you know, runs, runs the risk of being a black box. And obviously like regularization techniques, right? Even li li linear regression is uh, self-regularized to a large extent, but even, even those can, uh, without taking some precautions, even you, there you can be tricked into believing certain relationships that don't necessarily exist. So I think it's kind of a, um, it's, it's, it's more of a complex system, I think that we need to think about in terms of toolkits. Right, right, right. I agree. Uh, uh, exactly. And actually, what you said uh, leads us right to the second question, which is how do we deal with model risk and machine learning? All right. So, you know, is there a way to make machine learning more explainable? And uh, should we trust machine learning models more than traditional stochastic models, uh, you know, which, you know, some of them are chosen because they have an analytical solution and arguably that's not necessarily, uh, you know, a, a justifiable way to choose the model. But actually, uh, you know, in reality, the, the models uh, that people use, they're chosen first of all and first and foremost because we think they explain the market, right? And among these models, we select a subset that have an analytical solution, right? You know, we don't just go and, you know, say, well, that's a wonderful equation and has an analytical solution. It doesn't explain the market, but I don't care, All right? So, uh, you know, with machine learning, uh, you have more of a black box, right? And, and the question is, uh, how do we, how do we make it um, more explainable, right? So how do we trust, how, how would you learn to trust it? How do we understand what the model actually does? Uh, and, uh, you know, based on how successful or, or unsuccessful we're on that, you know, I think it will depend on whether the regulators and auditors will allow machine learning models for risk, machine, allow machine learning models for valuation, right? So whether, you know, you go to a risk committee, you go to uh, your auditors and you say, well, I have this uh, deep network that prices my derivative, you know, and uh, the question of well, how do you prove is correct. So how do we deal with model risk and machine learning? Um, I, I'll start, if, if you don't mind, by um, it, it's, it's somewhat of a, a, an interesting view. And, and it's one of, of thinking reductively. Um, in other words, under what simplifying assumptions does this particular architecture, whether it's a neural network, recover something that we already know and trust? Um, so if, for example, in a neural network, I turn off the activation, I just have, uh, you know, turn off the number of hidden layers. I should recover uh, a linear regression model, more or less, um, with with some redundancies. And similarly, with uh, autoencoders, if you turn off the activation, you should recover um, uh, PCA type approximations. And so, I think as a starting point, it, we should always start with what we know and compare machine learning under simplified settings, um, so that we can at least get comfortable with differences in, in, in toolkits, different algorithms, different implementation environments, and understand why results differ um, in the simplified setting. Because if you throw everything in, all bells and whistles, um, combined with different programming environments, different algorithms, you've got too many sources of variability. And so you need to narrow those down to start with um, in order to understand 
what machine learning is adding uh, to, to the existing set of tool, tools. So if we start from trusting basic statistical models, which are explainable, are interpretable, like linear regression, for example, how can we then move to more complicated models? And I think the only way that you can really uh, make sense of it is to have, uh, is to be able to find limiting cases where the machine learning model is essentially the same um, as, as some simplifying models. That's the first point. The second point I wanted to make is that, um, you know, by construction, neural networks and many different machine learning methods are not interpretable. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, we need new statistical tests that um, you know, can provide all the usual statistical significance properties that we see with normal statistical tools. The problem is, is that a lot of machine learning has not been cast in statistical frameworks, which do provide interpretability, um, do provide various guarantees of asymptotic, you know, T tests and F tests and so on, on the, to show that the parameters are significant. So basically we need more statistical tests, hypothesis tests, we don't want just an algorithm, we want a statistical framework, and that will provide more interpretability and help us assess uh, model risk as well. One, right. one area that's popular is derivatives pricing, and, you, and, and uh, Matthew, you talk about uh, benchmarking against simple models. You can actually benchmark against the existing models. I mean, you're, you're training against traditional derivatives models, and you can do that test just to make sure that your neural networks replicate the uh, results on, on the domain satisfactorily uh, well. And, I, and with respect to model risk, I actually think there's an opportunity to take steps forward here because a lot of times models are chosen for their performance. We talked about analytical models. We like analytical models that we think represent things well enough. Well, there are probably a lot of situations where we think that uh, it doesn't represent things well enough and there's this sort of gap between performance and uh, realism. And I think there's an opportunity here where you can actually build your traditional models, but they're just not performant enough, and then use uh, deep learning techniques basically to learn those models and provide the, uh, the performance that's necessary. So we can actually hopefully get people uh, confident that we can actually reduce the amount of model risk that's already out there from the need that, uh, to use performant analytical models. Right. Yeah, I agree completely. And actually, I think it's an excellent point about basically benchmarking against existing models. It goes two ways. First of all, yeah, basically generating, let's say, time series based on the existing statistical model and making sure that the machine learning model learns it and reproduces it correctly. We have complete control over how long the time series you give the model. Uh, and also you know exactly what the answer is. Uh, it, and, it, and another thing is, is absolutely the right way to make sure that you're not getting garbage. Uh, in fact, the workshop I'm going to teach on Monday, Tuesday, all of the data basically is generated by a traditional model. And then uh, machine learning is used to learn about this data and compare it you know, to the original. And that's the only way that you know that you're not getting uh, basically, uh, you know, completely spurious results. Uh, and, and, and those applications, yeah. you certainly don't have a scarce data problem either because you can run those traditional models exactly. as much as you want. Exactly, that's right. It, it, and you can you can uh, also determine the performance boundary. You can see you know exactly at what level of data it you know what's the amount of data at which the model breaks down and it cannot learn anymore. But also, it, another thing you can do the opposite, right? So you can use traditional models as a way to um, uh, to to understand what machine learning model did, because uh, what Alexei Kondratiev was talking about actually not at this conference uh, uh, where he gave a you know a quantum computing talk, but the previous uh, conference in the fall. Uh, basically market generators and, and Blanca Horvat and, and the co-authors, uh, uh, you know, there's a number of papers that are ex excellent papers where basically you use uh, machine learning to generate more data that they can then feed it into the tra traditional model. And uh, market generators started from filling gaps in the data, right? When you have time series gaps and so forth. But I think you can do a lot more. And that's what these papers say about. You can uh, use machine learning to learn from real data, then generate more data. And then you can analyze it with a traditional model. For example, you know you don't have enough uh, you know data to see uh, you know the precise shape of the volatility smile, right? But you know, but uh, once you have machine learning, you can actually then generate enough data to calibrate traditional model better with more flexibility, right? With you know basically less uh, regularization and see exactly what the model produced. And I think that that's one of the ways that perhaps the regulators uh, and auditors can become more comfortable. Namely, you run your machine learning model for enough. Uh, you know, you generate enough data points such that they, that you can use traditional statistics to see exactly what the properties are of the probability distributions that it produces. 
and uh, that I think is a way to 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 uh, really understand it better. So basically, it's two ways, right? So use traditional models to see how well machine learning models perform, then use machine learning model to produce something that traditional model can interpret for you in a way that you can understand better, right? For example, saying, well, that, that's actually the shape of the volatility surface that I produced. Yeah. All right, and uh, I, I think that another thing I want to highlight is, uh, is that where what can help us is, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of um, research recently in uh, uh, probabilistic machine learning, right? So basically things like variational of in quarters, and uh, you know some of them, you know, formally they are generative models, right? But some of them, uh, even though they are generative models, as opposed to just community models, right? So they are able to generate new samples. But another thing they do is that they also, other than being able to generate new data, which sometimes is not what you want, uh, they help you to understand the, the the limits of your knowledge. And uh, there was a you know there is a great. Um, uh, a blog uh, on TensorFlow website, uh, which you know, basically there's a new library called uh, TensorFlow Probability, uh, which has to do specifically with uh, with uh, Bayesian inference and other techniques um, uh, for probability, you know, machine learning techniques for probability. So there is a blog about um, uh, detecting, you know, the difference between epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty, which really, uh, in, in our you know parlance, is basically the one is volatility, right? So in other words uncertainty that you expect, you know, right? So, so basically, you know, you have volatility, so you expect some variation in your outputs, right? And there, are, there is also uncertainty where you simply don't know, right? You don't know what, what the uncertainty source of uncertainty is. And uh, there is a blog there showing how TensorFlow probability can detect uh, where is the ex basically known unknown, it where is the unknown unknown. But this block, interestingly enough, at least as of the time I checked a couple of months ago, uh, was kind of almost uh, you know, a warning um, uh, of uh, why you need it, right? Embedded in the same block, because what happened is that they said, well, you know, here there's a seasonal pattern in the data and here's how you can detect it, right? Even though it's not evident uh, with the naked eye, right? You just, you look at the data, it just seems random, but machine learning model was able to de detect seasonality behind the noise. Well. Is great, right? But the example they have in the blog, I think in the attempt to make it run faster, they didn't train enough. So you remove the seasonality from the input, right? So they generate their own data with seasonality, then they detect it. Well, what I found is that you remove the line in Python code that generates the seasonality and it still detects the seasonality even though with a smaller magnitude. So I think it's, it's kind of almost like a, you know, a way to, a way, the way to go and also the, the, the uh, you know, warning of what can happen if you're not careful. So, uh, so I, I think some of this uh, new machine learning techniques uh, can also help us understand when the model is performing and when the model is not performing as part of running the model. So, and, and, and that's great. All right, so uh, anyone else wants to add on this topic before we move on to the next one? Just yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of, couple of words. Uh, so, so this, uh, this uh, uh, usages of using, uh, <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> using machine learning to generate uh, new data is, is really very interesting proposition, but I think it has more value for uh, things such as scenario generation rather than for valuation. And the reason I'm saying that is because, um, well, my understanding of all this is, is the following, right? You can construct auto, uh, auto encoder train it on available data, simulate more data, right? So by construction, you will match your data in the bulk, right? Where you have most of your data, right? But you will not have control in the tails, right? So what you produce from your generative model in the tails is still model risk, right? So that's yeah. why I'm saying it's a great tool for scenario generation where you just want to produce, you know, sufficiently rich scenarios in order to see robustness of your model. But if you're, you know, whatever pricing model or whatever that that, that, that you uh, that you use uh, uh, autoencoders for, if it's sensitive to tail risk, then you you have no escape from model risk. It's not right. possible. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. All right, so uh, now with that uh, next topic, uh, and again, I want to um, uh, uh, remind that if there are any additional questions that are not on the list of topics that we're planning to cover in the panel, please type it in the chat uh, or, or let yourself be known uh, to to, um, uh, uh, to anyone um, who is a co-host. So, uh, uh, so next question is how much value machine learning is that? Because uh, machine learning generally is hard, right? Computationally, first of all, it's hard, you know, uh, you know, hard to build the models, 
new libraries make it better, make it easier. Uh, but it's always hard computationally, right? So you know, some of these models, uh, some of the more advanced models and more variables, you know, they they, they require massive massive uh, parallel computing uh, for 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 training, right? And uh, most of the models they are slow to train fast to use right and in some cases uh, you can train once and use it uh, many times which is how in most cases uh, in big tech uses uh, this big data machine learning models but in finance uh, you always have new time series data right so you need, you, so you need to um, uh, be update as a minimum you need to be updating your training uh, sometimes you need to be retraining right so it's hard and there are some applications uh, where uh, you cannot even reuse the existing model time after time or not always like for example for derivatives pricing in a lot of cases what you're doing is uh, specific to a derivative and you have a lot of them in the portfolio so the question is uh, you know how much uh, value machine learning is adding are we, are we trying to use machine learning for problems that we can still solve using conventional techniques easier and better Right, you know, for example, uh, one-dimensional regression is there really need. You know, is machine learning able to really do anything better with with uh, one-dimensional or two-dimensional regression uh, or interpolation than uh, you know a couple of decades of uh, research and curve building and basically you know smoothing splines and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it, it, a related question is classical machine learning uh, stuff that you can find in scikit-learn versus more advanced models, stuff that you can find in PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so forth. I, you know, I, 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 what, what is, has more promise? Let, let me take a stab at this. I mean, certainly there are a lot of great classical techniques that uh, deep learning and stuff like that don't have to replace. But if you will allow me an analogy, I'm kind of thinking about uh, amateur photographer. I mean, the deep learning sort of approach is like a zoom lens. Basically, you can use it quite general, solve a lot of different problems. So yeah, maybe a, a prime lens. <laughs> it's kind of like these uh, traditional techniques. It's well fitted. It's actually probably better for the technique. But if you can only take one lens with you and carry it around and stuff like that, you're going to take your handy dandy zoom lens with you. It just allows it's it it you can apply it across more problems. So us old school guys and stuff like that, we're not going to give up on our on the things that uh, we know and we know that they work well. But I, I really don't see why you're going to want five different specific solutions if a general solution can actually handle those uh, acceptably well. It's just, a, it's just about leverage and your, in, uh, your intellectual leverage. So if you have a, a general tool, I, I, I think you put the effort in there if the general tool can get the job done. Right. Other panelists? I'm not no, I cannot. Maybe related to my presentation, what what I really like. So I usually am more conservative. I, as matter of fact, I have PhD in statistics. So I tend to favor towards classic statistical work. On the other hand, where it's you cannot really apply, say, traditional statistical methods is um, like say not even big data, but data where you have many features, right? A classic example, you want to do some alternative data, maybe based on different sentiment or macroeconomic variables. Anything can be served as a variable, right? Spread between two year and 10 year treasury, right? Or spreads, cross country spreads. So you can think, you can put like 10 of I mean, okay, still it's a reasonable dimension, but you can generate as many data as you want, right? For your explanatory variable uh, features. So now, but, but how you choose, right? You, in a classic regression, you end up with like 10,000 parameters, 20,000 parameters, which you apply linear regression, right? So it's not some, something to start with. Whereas I, a nice combination, what has been more say recently over work, what been done in eighties, nineties was a lasso regression. It's it's very nice. It's actually a lot of also interesting generalizations. Maybe people not frequently talk, but uh, group lasso, like different where you put different constraints either so for your um, rows or columns of, of your uh, prediction matrix. These are very nice, and these are what actually combines what people call more like traditional 
statistics with more advanced one, where I think maybe less like, confidence is uh, bootstrap methods or XGB boosts, where you effectively you have layer of say traditional regressions and then you are trying to pick up which one is the best. So it is again, what, what say to answer it, it's a really reduction of basis of trying to find out of multi-dimensional features, you are trying to find a subset of influential features where I think you cannot do it with classical, like say traditional statistics, you need to put some constraints, right? On the other hand, if you go more into some like uh, more that combines non-parametric, so techniques with parametric that I, I'm not so confident that. And question is always the dimension, how much data you have. And non even though people tend to like non-parametric methods as you have say, put less assumptions, but what they forget actually that you have more data points, right? To find us a good solution, good not changing solution for your non-parametric model, you need much more data points. Yeah, when we talk about, yeah. mm -hmm. sorry. Okay. When we talk about, uh, you know, simple linear regression, I assume we all also talk about something like elastic net, which takes into account probability and the kind of squashes those coefficients. So it, you start with something super simple, like a classic vanilla linear regression, and you kind of layer um, slight more and more complexity um, until you get to something like, um, you know, uh, reinforcement learning or so, something that's, um, you know, quote unquote, not, not as explainable. <clears throat> I feel like, um, <clears throat> Like I said, there are use cases for every specific uh, model, and I think it's a it's a it's a rainbow rather than a kind of a s clean line of interpretability versus non-interpretability, no complexity, non-complexity. I mean, um, the um, RBMs uh, and the kernel, um, the RBF kernel in the uh, SVMs, for example, that's a that's a pretty complicated uh, concept, difficult to explain, and uh, I feel, I feel like it, uh, there is already a decent amount of value that, uh, that's being um, extracted out of deep learning, specifically for like image recognition, obviously that's being used in finance. So uh, wouldn't discount it necessarily um, you know, as, as, a, as not being valuable in finance. Similar with uh, kind of convolutional neural networks in natural language processing can be applied to create a signal that you can then perhaps test with more classical models. So, um, in terms of interpretability, I think it's a, it's a, it's a question of a time. How how over what period are we, are we or the regulators going to be comfortable with these sorts of techniques? There's already like uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, are making decisions based on these models, and eventually they're likely to be accepted by the regulators. Um, but even to kind of to get to not get too philosophical, philosophical, but in terms of interpretability, the human brain is not exactly very interpretable. Uh, um, a lot of the people who control decent amount of AUM, they think they make decisions based on very explainable, explainable, <laughs> rational uh, uh, thought processes. But in fact, when you kind of dig deeper, and there are a few studies, uh, great studies that show this, is that they confabulate in order to fit their decision, the decision that they made to the story, to the narrative. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure that uh, a human brain uh, is ex exactly interpretable. And I think it's a matter of time before we recognize that, you know, a model that works, that's well uh, developed can add value in even in uh, something like derivatives pricing. All right, I'll, I'll just, um, yeah. I just want to add very quickly as well, just to, to some of those points, I mean, when we think about what machine learning adds over statistics, I, I think you it's too big a question, too broad a question. If you break it down into, do you need nonlinearity? Uh, the role of regularization, the emphasis more on regularization, like lasso elastic net. Uh, the role of model averaging committees, consensus, exactly this a point that um, Marco was making, that an individual investor is easily able to contort the world to, to, to fit their views. But if you're in a committee, it's harder to do that because there has to be a consensus around it. 
machine learning does that as well through consensus, through, for example, things like uh, you know, ensemble type methods. So I think we have to look at the problem, break it down into different pieces and say, what aspect of machine learning is really useful for this problem? Maybe it's all three of those things. Maybe it's just one. But the ensemble models, you could have as many as you want and have uh, some sort of a nearest neighbor um, final layer that selects the most likely, um, the most successful point and basically naturally kicks out the outliers, which is basically the fear. Your fear from this unexplainable deep learning scary model is that it's going to produce uh, an outrageous output that, you, that is likely to um, cause some damage to your portfolio. And kind of like Matthew said, having an ensemble, like a committee that kicks it out naturally uh, regularizes some of that. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. I think uh, one thing I wanted to actually uh, say, uh, you know, in response to what Arthur uh, uh, was talking about is that, uh, you know, machine learning is not just neural networks, right? So, uh, you know, normally when students go in class, well, you know, when do I learn about, you know, neural network? But if you look at most of the courses, right, you know, what they teach is actually, uh, you know, neural networks is your part, it's an important part, but it's not all of it. And uh, I think that what's really, we should credit machine learning in enthusiasm for neural networks rather, for bringing attention to some of the statistical techniques which don't have to do with neural networks, but are used in um, training them, right? Like for example, Lasso, right? So what Lasso does, essentially, if you have a very large number of variables, uh, it does principal components in the way that basically goes along the edge, right? So it says out of a thousand features, it tells you which five are the most important. And uh, you know that you can do it with traditional techniques if you're talking about harmonics of the yield curve, which are naturally arranged in a sequence. But if you throw a bag of completely heterogeneous data, you know, things like Lasso, you know, they can do it, you know, when statistical, you know, basically traditional statistics uh, were used to in quant research, like PCA cannot. And uh, I agree completely. I think Lasso is absolutely a tremendous technique where you can say like, you know, which, which five things out of a thousand are most important. Uh, and it can figure it out, uh, you know, without I mean, any natural kind of progression of the way you say, well, you have, uh, you know, parallel shift, you have tilt, right? So when you don't have that, you know, Lasso, it's a great technique. Another great technique is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, Hamiltonian uh, Monte Carlo, right? So basically, it's used, uh, you know, in uh, various ways uh, in uh, machine learning. But you can use it just standalone, uh, without uh, you know anything on top of it, without neural networks. Essentially, it, it, it's a way to stop your optimizer from converging to a local minimum. It's essentially it's a way that we're basically use Hamiltonian mechanics to make it uh, have momentum, such that they can explore the space better. And that's a technique also, I think that's a, uh, you know, it's a very old technique, it predates neural networks uh, and uh, it just has been brought with all of the other, uh, you know, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods has been brought uh, to the forefront, I, I, I think it's great. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of techniques uh, that are extremely powerful, they're not necessarily neural network techniques, but uh, they're almost like forgotten, you know, well forgotten or maybe perhaps not even forgotten, but uh, not well known statistics that's not well known to quant research. And people like Arthur, of course, with the, with the right education, uh, extremely familiar with that, right? But I think most quants who go to mathematical finance course, before they did not necessarily know about these techniques, and now they do because of thanks to machine learning. So I think it's uh, uh, it's really something that um, should be in our arsenal uh, with or without uh, uh, neural networks. So uh, yeah, and, and another thing is, uh, uh, you know, what, what Marcus said, uh, it, it, with the outrageous results, I think that what we should remember uh, when somebody challenges us about, uh, you know, whether a machine learning model will give outrageous results is that uh, traditional models also sometimes gives completely absurd results. And we're almost used to them. So we sweep them under the carpet. Uh, I mean, many times I saw, uh, you know, derivatives pricing model collaboration, which made no sense whatsoever, right? So it was predicting risk factors at long horizons that are, you know, a rates of minus 3%, minus 5% right? if there is cash or, you know, the ability to invest in a different country that just cannot happen, right? Unless you prohibit, uh, you know, foreign exchange uh, and, and, and uh, uh, alternative store of value, right? Uh, you know, things which basically uh, uh, don't make sense. And then uh, the most frequent explanation is that, oh, that's a measure change, right? So, you know, well, yeah, it's absurd but it's in risk neutral measure. Now, actually that we're able to, you know, there've been several talks at the conference uh, where you can actually estimate the risk premium. And of course, uh, you know, as it turned out that uh, risk premium normally uh, is not something that can explain that, right? So a lot of these things that, well, we don't know what the risk premium is, that's absurd. So it's probably the risk premium that did it and real world measure, everything would be fine. So I think that um, 
now we're also trying, you know, beginning to understand that some of the traditional statistical models that, uh, you know, traditional quant finance models that we're using, they produce absurd results in certain cases. And we hope that these results are not affecting our answers. So basically prices, you know, the way that we price derivatives, the way we calculate risk. We hope that this absurd extreme quantiles of these models uh, are not affecting these conclusions that we're making from the models. With machine learning, actually, I think it happens a lot less. You know, there are some, like for example, the restricted Boltzmann machine. Basically, it will not predict a you know point in the space that uh, in this in this in the state variable space, uh, in a Fisher space, it will not generate a point for you if there's no data in that area, right? So in other words, uh, it only go where there are previously points. So I think it's a great property because basically you know that it will not be giving you outliers uh, that the model um, does not have it. You know, you can make it this way. You can make it arbitrage free without doing things like Nelson Siegel. So uh, it, it, I think that machine learning can perhaps be at some, you know, it, it, it perhaps very near future be seen as perhaps even more explainable and more reliable than traditional statistical model because of what you know we just talked about where the uh, lack of subjective I, I'd, I'd echo that because we're doing work right now on vaes we're not explicitly training them to be no arbitrage but they're trained on market data which by its origin or yep, essence exactly. is, is right. it has no arbitrage so that we find even when we kind of extrapolate and we make uh, uh stressed surfaces and stuff like that those stressed surfaces don't introduce arbitrage because they've kind of learned from the, the data that what constitutes no arbitrage sort of condition. I think if you use sort of traditional sort of stressing of uh, ball surfaces and stuff like that, hey, you can do a parallel shift and it can introduce arbitrage. The cool thing about the VAEs and stuff like that is because it's been trained on data that has no arbitrage. When you actually introduce shifts in the latent space, you actually still end up with ball surfaces that are stressed, but they're actually... Uh, arbitrage free it's a really uh, interesting finding exactly yeah absolutely yeah so so uh, there is a lot of potential there i think for uh generating a lot of value and also becoming uh you know the more trusted type of model uh, uh you know compared to to, to what we had um, in traditional models uh, all right, so uh, so with that, let me move to the next. We have a couple of um, uh, questions remaining. Again, uh, anyone who would like to um, talk about anything else, please uh, put it in the chat. Uh, so what is the greatest potential for machine learning and systematic trading, right? So what styles of systematic trading can benefit from machine learning? You know, is it, um, you know, the, is it high frequency? Is it uh, traditional long short? You know, is it macro? Uh, and how can machine learning be, or how should it be applied to systematic trading? Or what's most promising? Is it time series analysis? Is it uh, what Arthur was talking about, which is uh, alternative data use, uh, you know, sentiment analysis for language processing? So where are we? Uh, uh, you know, what of these three ways to use um, uh, machine learning and systematic training, right? So it was language processing, sentiment analysis, uh, alternative data, or just plain old time series, except that we're using machine learning to analyze it. Uh, I'd like to hear the opinions of you know what, what's most promising and for what asset classes. I think systematic trading really is the culminating task of machine learning in, in quant finance. And there's really uh, three strands that are really, we're still at the beginning of those strands and they have to be kind of woven together in order to get systematic trading sort of uh, by machine learning accomplished. One, I mean, I guess ultimately it's reinforcement learning, but for reinforcement learning, we need to have the data. So how do, how do, how do we do, how do we get the data sorted out? And you talked about GANs and uh, other generative techniques, for example. And then finally, if you want to trade uh, complicated models, you're going to have to train up that reinforcement learning by playing the game over and over and over again. You're going to need sort of fast models. So you've got supervised learning for the fast models, unsupervised learning for the market data generation, and then reinforcement learning. All three of those things, we have a lot of work to do. But when those strands come together, then you're going to see a very powerful sort of... Uh, application for a uh, systematic trading. Right. Uh, I would like to add that uh, definitely reinforcement learning is a conceptual framework for systematic trading, which can adapt to any signals. You can use NLP there, you can use anything, right? Uh, as part of your state description. Uh, but I just wanted to make a comment that uh, it's not necessarily that you have to do lots of, have to have lots of data to train reinforcement learning. It really depends on your algorithm. 
So in my presentation, I described very, very simple, uh, you know, reward uh, function for reinforcement learning, which only has four parameters. So basically training of this model is as easy as classical models. What, what, what remains is the framework, right? How you apply reinforcement learning, how you apply value iteration, but it's not like, it's not uh, synonymous things, like right? reinforcement learning is not synonymous to uh, neural nets. You can disentangle them. Right, right, exactly. But still, you know, what are the, uh, let's just, you know, maybe take a, like a, let's go, uh, you know, every panel is kind of voting, right? So for systematic trading, sentiment analysis, alternative data or time series. All right, so uh, the step from, from uh, Ryan should go in sequence, right? So uh, which of the three you think are most promising uh, for machine learning use in systematic training and in training? You didn't mention reinforcement learning. And, you know, well, I, I'm, talking, Leah, I'm talking less about, uh, uh, less about um, how, you know, the, the machine learning technique, but more about the data, right? So, so you know, oh. what data do you use, oh, okay. right? So, so you know, sen basically, Sentiment analysis, meaning using natural language processing uh, to see, you know, what's happening on Twitter, what's happening, uh, you know, on social media, basically to inform your trading decisions. Basically, or other, you know, if you obviously inform your trading decisions, if you are the other AI is going to be your, tweeting that we can interpret. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think I think actually a lot of bots are tweeting something, right? So maybe some yeah. of them are actually manipulating the market, yeah. right? But but I, I shouldn't have said inform the trading decisions because that's discretionary, right? I'm talking about driving the systematic driving the systematic strategy, right? So sentiment analysis through natural language processing by using machine learning, alternative data, uh, and by alternative data, you know, there was a proverbial, proverbial uh, satellite images of uh, cars in parking lots uh, and so forth, which actually evidently is not as useful as people once thought it was. Or maybe, you know, maybe it, 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 a select few know how to use it properly, but the rest of us don't. Right, uh, or just plain old time series analysis, but uh, not using traditional statistics, but using machine learning. So out of the three, I, I'd like to take it just going around the panel, let's just take like a vote, what, which, which is most promising. And you can answer all three, right? I'll go with four, number four. Okay, what? <laughs> traditional like statistical arbitrage stuff, not necessarily along the uh, time dimension basically. So certainly things across assets, using things like VAEs and stuff like that to look for things that seem to be out of, out of line. Mm -hmm. Igor? Well, uh, should I, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, should I say number five or whatever? Like, uh, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> what All right, I, so what I meant five. to say by that yeah. is that- Seven uh, people on the panel, we get 11 answers. Exactly right. <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, what I meant by that is that definitely I believe that NLP signals are very important. But uh, like the reason I'm saying number five is is uh, I, I'm not entirely convinced that we exhausted, you know, uh, traditional like maybe non-traditional like kind of alternative within the financial data sets. Right. So are we fully uh, you know using information in uh, I don't know open interests? Are we fully using information in options? Right. Uh, are we using information across, uh, you know, across markets? Like how informative credit markets about equities and vice versa and things like that, right? So this is what I call number five. Yeah, I agree with you. Let's, let, let's say that four and a half and we agree on four and a half. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, yes. yeah. All right. So that sounds good. Well, you know, Matthew, I Matthew? I would look at, you know, traditionally before we had sort of machine learning, which was a long time ago, but that's, you know, before it was as prominent, where were quant trading firms or where were trading shops making a lot of money? What were they doing? How were they getting their data? What was a human doing that was the most profitable? Um, and I would argue that within equities, it was often having, you know, very, very specific sort of insight into uh, particular aspects of companies. And you know, I'm not saying in, inside of trading. So I would go with alternative data um, as being the primary source, as that seems to be what uh, was the secret source for a lot of the quant trading shops and or just trading shops in general that made make money. They seem to have access to data that no one else has. So if machine learning can exploit that, that would seem to be uh, the winning ticket. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. Arthur, what's your view? So on my side, I'm more like what we do is more like 
time series based. Mm -hmm. And of course, macro, what I think sentiment data for macro is definitely interesting. Is traditionally you have shops who did like say systematic macro, but it's more like using say rate differentials or, or stuff like, of course you can aggregate them all together. And here is again, it's what is more interesting where you can have much. So it has both like what is NLP is interpretation. So interpretation textual data, right? Or, or someone say a Fed president talks like this different where say you have interpretation, right? You train your model, then you need to train, of course, on time series, right? You need to see what is exactly a forecasting power right? that we are talking. In the end, we want to predict prices. We're not interested in sentiment per se. I say, and where I think it's most, say, in my opinion, is most, say, promising. And of course, of say alternative data like satellite. For systematic shock, the threshold is actually very high. So you you really you don't have enough data to justify that this actually can be profitable, say on long term or somehow. You know, so where I, I think like say macro or, or sentiment data, maybe you have higher frequency of strategies, so you can say justify the economics of using it. Okay. Uh, I assume when we say ML, we mean kind of deeper learning <laughs> sort of approach. Uh, um, well, uh, 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 just to clarify the question, right? So not about how we use it or what machine learning yeah. uh, algorithm is used, right? What the, what is the data that we use, right? So sentiment uh, with um, natural language processing, alternative yeah. or time series. Yeah, I, I I think sentiment in natural language processing is an obvious obvious one, and that's already being applied. Um, but I think given enough time, I think it's going to be all, all of them. Really, get, just given enough time, given enough uh, uh, research into the techniques, novel techniques, n and novel data, um, even for data collection, which will in turn result in better trading strategies. So I think given enough time, it's pro probably going to be all of them. It should be all be systematic and machine learning driven. Um, but I also think um, it's, it's really a matter of data probably in the end and how we process it. Because uh, I, I don't like the kind of throwing around the term AI because really what we're doing is kind of statistical inference via large data sets. And given enough of those uh, layers and modules that we put together, kind of more specialized algorithms built into a larger one, you get closer to something that's, uh, that looks like AI. So I think given enough time, probably uh, most. Uh, okay, David? Um, I mean, I think I think I'm probably on the mainly on the old, sort of alternative data front. Although I would agree the comment uh, about say taking data from credit and using it to tell you something about equities. It's not alternative data, but it's using more data, sort of pulling more data into the same place. Um, you know, I, I mean, there are things we I've messed around with things, sort of trying to just use time series approaches, and you can come up with stuff. Um, and you can come up with things that work, that work better than traditional, say, CTA momentum strategies. Um, your, your, your problem is you do end up with this sort of situation where you're going, well, I'm not quite sure why it works. Um, and therefore, I don't know when it won't work. Um, so I think, you know, I think alternative data finding, finding alpha, if you want to call it that, in, in other sources is, is a good one. Um, and I, and I think, you know, I guess there the secret is finding your, your alternative data source that nobody else has. And that's the real trick. Right, right. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. So uh, 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 let me go last. Um, uh, uh, and I think that I would say that, uh, I, I probably say that I, I agree uh, with everyone. Because I think all of these are good points. Uh, I, I think all three uh, also, and uh, it just depends on what you're doing, right? First of all, on sentiment, I completely agree with Arthur. I, I think that, um, it, it, you know, there's a lot of noise in basically what is being said and how it affects the markets. Uh, proverbial, uh, you know, example is bad news about uh, the dollar always uh, caused the dollar to go up, right? Because it's all global instability goes up. Uh, Federal Reserve is famous, right? They say it's one thing, market does the opposite because uh, it's expected worse or, you know, something like that. 
So I think that uh, sentiment analysis, I agree with Arthur, you know, I think it's very unpredictable, but what it can do is that it can, you can use it to control risk, right? So your systematic strategy, you may be seeking volatility or you may be avoiding volatility. Depending on what, what, what is the way that you're getting alpha, you may wanna stay out of like social investing stocks, for example, using the latest example from a couple of months ago, right, January, uh, or you wanna actually seek stocks like, you know, that, that, that are being uh, basically uh, uh, all over Twitter, uh, you know, because your strategy actually can make money on the stock. So I think, I think you can use sentiment to control risk and to select your investment universe, basically among the stocks that basically are not being actively discussed on social media versus those that are, are as, as opposed to looking alpha, basically risk, but not alpha. But uh, in alternative data, I, I think it has tremendous potential, but only for strategies that are slow, right? So it's like macro, anything, uh, because, you know, there's a lot of data, it's just, you know, basically if your strategy is a holding period, basically in months or years, right? So then, then you know, definitely you can uh, uh, use alternative data. I think that, you know, if you're, if you're trading basically intraday, right? Or, you know, a holding period in some days, I think it's um, harder to justify um, uh, using alternative data just because it's a, there's always a lag uh, and you don't know exactly what the lag is. You know, I think it's also variable. Uh, depending on the market volatility, the lag becomes shorter. So, so I would say uh, sentiment for controlling risk, alternative data for longer holding periods, and time series combined with one or the other uh, or both. So, so that would, would be my answer. I all totally right, agree so, with all of those points. Maybe perhaps to add one, one other point uh, in terms of Reddit, those were uh, mm -hmm. kind of opportunities there where something like NLP could be applied, but it's a challenge, right? Because uh, you're looking at very unusual sentence structures, such as uh, just YOLO the thousand shares of GameStop. I mean, you can do a uh, inverse uh, frequency matrix of the mentions of GameStop, but in, in terms of discerning meaning from such sentences, um, you can. how do you do it systematically? Do you add uh, manually something like uh, YOLO in, into your embedding matrix, or do you develop a more novel systematic technique for um, Kind of discerning those trending topics. I think it's a, yeah, it's it's a matter of uh, developing those new techniques, which are probably going to come about relatively soon. Right, right, I agree. All right, so uh, so at that point, uh, we're at one hour. Uh, we still have a couple of questions to go. So I just want to ask the panelists: uh, uh, Does anyone have a hard stop, you know, right now, or 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 can we go for a little bit longer and maybe ask questions from the audience? Uh, uh, anyone has uh, you know anywhere to urgently get to? I'm fine to go. You, everybody's good or? Yeah, okay, good, right. Okay, so yeah, so let's just go, uh, you know, so basically we spent our, our hour, I think, in a very productive discussion. Uh, you know, we have uh, still, uh, you know, I, I was watching the number of participants. We, we, we didn't lose any people, so that's a great sign, right? So we, we have not been boring. Uh, so uh, it, let me just uh, use the last uh, couple of questions. It's really one question with two different aspects of it um, and just uh, open it for a discussion. If anybody from the audience uh, would like to comment, uh, would like to introduce a new question or just would like to, Applying on anything that we've covered so far, you know, please um, uh, let me know uh, through the chat. I'm watching the chat. Uh, so I'm Alexander Sokol. So, so, so that, you know, please chat me uh, or chat Ed from WBS. Uh, so the last two questions and also, you know, invitation to open discussion, what are the applications that we can list as, as examples of, of machine learning success in finance? And what are the global trends, right? And what's, what are the current successes and what I can rephrase it as what are the current successes and what we think will be the future successes in the, you know, over the past, over the next, uh, you know, say, you know, one, two, three years, right? Is it a time series analysis? Is it, uh, you know, alpha generation? Is it derivative evaluation? Is it uh, risk? Uh, so, you know, what have been successful and what we think will be successful in the future? It's a good question. If, uh, if I put my perspective, I actually, if you talk of systematic trading, the first successful was a time series trading in uh, late 80s, 90s. At that time, if you talk of, say, statistical, say, anomalies, at that time, no one actually understood that price momentum was persistent. So, right. And the first funds who, who got into that, they generated like decent, de decent profits. And this is, I mean, it's, basic statistics done right, right? nothing more then you had more like maybe mid 90s 2000 is more like statistical what is called statistical arbitrage so mean reversion when you 
by users, sales performers. Also, it's more into like bigger data, right? You had more analyzed cross-sectional, new cross-sectional models, right? And then they also kind of it died out, right? So right now, I think risk parity also you can think of, it's also like it's a learning, right? In some sense, you apply some method that where you learn and you apply it. And before no one realized that this method are like profitable, you, you do a success, right? So in case what, what next, I think it's really like more really sentiment, maybe this type of alternative, but alternative, not really satellite images, something that can predict the direction of markets or being able to detect certain patterns. Right? That, that this is the next, something that combines both, like say textual sentiment or something that can be put a number and combined with uh, uh, dynamic reassessment, the dynamic price impact in both for selection, for risk allocation, that will be next. All right, thank you. Other panelists? In terms of what you, I was gonna say, in terms of what you consider uh, success, right? I think uh, there's that kind of little nagging problem of the paradox of skill. I think is overall skill kind of improves in the market and more money comes in, more competition comes in, more techniques come in, and it's harder to grind out excess returns. So, and I think in terms of ultimate success, it like is going to be um, a never achieving goal. It always needs to kind of keep improving until the market's perfectly efficient. And uh, we have all the data at our disposal. Um, because uh, something, something even, um, and it, regime shifts, um, the volatility smile didn't exist forever. It kicked in at one point in time, and then um, all of a sudden you have a new opportunity to trade around. Um, like statistic, statistical arbitrage um, before Rentec uh, came in big with the what what's considered now um, simple techniques. They really kind of banked on data uh, when they started collecting it. So, and I think an obvious one is applying um, these models to alternative data. In, uh, in kind of introducing that, um, uh, you know, exploiting the non-linearity that uh, these models can uh, can discern. And then um, I, th I, think, uh, I think it's almost difficult to, it's difficult to predict what the world will look like in 10 years. My bet is at some point it's going to be all fully systematic model driven. I'll take, I'll take a stab at the uh, second two points that you listed there, derivatives valuation and capital and margin optimization. Derivatives valuation, it's already a success. There are banks that have uh, deep learning accelerated models in production in their XVA systems today. I mean, it's not widespread yet, but uh, I would say the fact that these things have, I mean, gone quite quickly into uh, production environments is uh, very clearly puts it in the category of success. Capital margin optimization, I think one of the things that makes that so difficult is a lot of the things that take up so much of the capital and margin are relatively exotic trades that take a long time to value and it, therefore it's hard to figure out what the uh, optimization is because you can't generate that much uh, sort of paths through your portfolio to figure out how to get it to be more optimum. So. I think number two really leads to number three, as you get to the ability to, to revalue your portfolio a lot more cheaply, a lot more quickly, that opens things up to capital margin optimization to uh, really take a step forward. Yeah, I would add that I think um, this world um, of telebs of black swans will um, become much less of a sort of an unknown event coming from nowhere as we build event-driven data and causal graphs relating all that's happening in the world. For example, a ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal. We have a, gra a graph immediately will tell us what the impact is gonna be on the oil market. It's, that, that, it's not gonna be just a sudden blip from nowhere. We're gonna have very granular models, things that go on that try, represent deep fundamental knowledge in those markets. And I can see that being a massive shift in the way that uh, we think about finance and quant finance. Think of stress testing, for example. I think stress testing right now sort of requires maybe 300 stresses of 
a bank's portfolio, you think of how big that risk space is, how many risk parameters are, and how much coverage of your portfolio 300 tests give you. It's basically not good coverage at all. I mean, so if you can run your models a million times faster and 300 turns into 300 million, hopefully somewhere in there is a cargo ship getting stuck in the Suez and you can see that that's actually going to cost you a lot of money and you can actually put on the hedges and stuff like that so you don't lose money when that does happen right now and it's it's probably not in your 300 stress test that you're running. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that's worked, uh, you know, sentiment analysis, NLP, you know, we've seen that and there's a few, there's sort of people out there doing that, that seems to work very well. Um, it, partly because language doesn't really change. Uh, so, you know, you sort of words tend to mean the same thing. So you can train these models very, very well. So I think that's been very effective. I think the sort of this alternative data machine learning crossover, which, you know, it's really more the alternative data and then using uh, some machine learning techniques to sort of interpret it or pull, th pull information out of it. I'll, I'll say that. I think that's been very, very successful. Um, I think... You know what you probably see least success with it in some ways is is the pure alpha decision you know the, the pure trading decision because that's difficult i mean we know that's the hardest sort of question to answer um you know and i think what's been interesting is as we've started to do this i mean yes i mean, i'll pick up on matthew's comment from earlier about you know you need this combination of statistics and and these machine learning techniques so you know there, there are papers out there where people were um sort of you know you you run lasso so you run your regression you use lasso to do variable selection and then you do a second pass um regression to do significance testing well that's wrong you know there the, your, your null hypothesis isn't right and there is now a paper out there and I, please don't ask me the reference because i cannot now remember it um where somebody said actually no you know you can you've got a you've, you can do it you know you can do this properly in a single pass and actually get significance out of it so that sort of this sort of combination, you know, I think this is where it's going to really work is, is exactly picking on Matthew's point where you do start getting statistics and some of these machine learning techniques combining. And I think the other one is the other thing that I think really has been successful and, and can, will keep being successful and again driven by the same thing of, of computational power is a lot of the Bayesian stuff that, you know, admitting that we don't know the truth. Um, I mean, I used to be at UBS, we had analysts who forecast sort of, you know, share prices and their share price forecast was a single point. You know, I think this company is going to £5.50. No, well, yes, it probably is at some point, who knows. But, you know, as a one year forecast uh, at £5.50, it's wrong. It's bound to be wrong. You know, so, so we were trying to encourage people to have distrib effectively do distributional forecasts. Now, it's quite it's quite hard. It's a conceptual leap. But that you know, but again, that idea of of we don't know the future. You will never know the future. But at least you, if you can make some prob probabilistic some you know statements about it, maybe that's helpful. So again, you know, this idea of um, I can't remember who was mentioned it. The idea of yes, yeah, sort of Bayesian machine learning, uh, or you know, is to me. I think seems to be the right place to go, although you then get into the interpretability issue. I mean, that's the one downside of that is, you know, it's hard enough to explain a normal machine learning model, stick what stick Bayesian on top of it. <laughs> you know, mm. it's tricky. All right, okay. So uh, yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I think, uh, let me just uh, make one remark uh, in conclusion. Um, we need to be wrapping up, uh, uh, I think at some point. So. Uh, I, I think I agree completely with everything was said, but I, I, I would like to introduce another dimension to it. I think uh, successful machine learning and finance and quant finance, we serious will success, we will be successful uh, applying machine learning. Uh, we have one axis of how hard it is, right? There is another axis. Who do you have to convince? Uh, if you're using it for alpha, you have to convince the chief investment officer, right? And that's uh, requires, you know, perhaps. Uh, uh, you know, this will happen on, you know, one time scale because, uh, you know, this is a, it's a small community, you know, people go to conferences, people talk, right, you know, the information um, uh, goes around. So I think that uh, chief investment officer, you know, as a community, right, as a group of people will become increasingly convinced that machine learning can be used for alpha generation. And uh, then, you know, it's hard 
but it's possible, right? And people have been very successful. You know, many of the, you know, we mentioned uh, Rentec, you know, there, there are the funds, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, some of these funds were actually using some of these machine learning techniques, uh, you know, earlier than the rest of us, right? And that's what made them successful. So, so it's, it's possible, right? It's hard, but it's possible, but also you have to convince the CIO. Uh, another thing is that you have to convince the risk manager, right? So you have to convince the chief risk officer, right, to use it for risk, right? So if you if your risk model is based on machine learning, you're not you know you're not using quantiles, right? You're saying I'm not going to use historical Monte Carlo, right? I'm not going to look at Sharpie, Certina, you know, I'm not going to look at um, uh, you know factor analysis in a traditional way. I'm going to build a machine learning risk model for the buy side. Right, you have to convince the chief risk officer that that's the right approach, and you will not miss. Uh, you know, basically, the fund will not blow up. Same thing with uh, on the on the sell side. In order to use it for risk, you have to convince the regulator, right? And I think that you know, with the Basel Committee, uh, you know, there's a uh, you know frequent uh, uh, frequent reaction there is that well, that's too complex, right? You know, if you look at some of the Basel regulation. Uh, you know, the methods are intentionally very simple, just so that it's uniform, you know, there have been a number of exercises where different banks were given the same portfolio and came up with, uh, uh, you know, very different capital numbers for the same portfolio, just because of the difference in model assumptions. And that actually drove, uh, you know, the, the, the Basel Committee to in the completely opposite direction, right? So we're here, we're talking, going from traditional stochastic differential equation models to machine learning. But if you, you know, the people who are work who work in this area, you know, basically regulatory uh, regulatory capital, you know, know that actually it has been going in the opposite direction where, you know, some, some of the internal model methods were previously permitted are no longer permitted just because this exercise has showed significant variation, which, you know, basically different banks were, were making different assumptions about the same portfolio. So now it's all going back to simpler methods, uh, some of the even prescriptive correlation matrices that are, uh, you know, based on uh, on the document as opposed to anything from the historical data and so forth. So I think I would say, uh, uh, you know, it's also a function of who you have to convince. And I think that uh, regulators on the Basel Committee are probably the most difficult to convince. But, you know, over the years, I hope they will come around and accept machine learning uh, down the line, but certainly not anytime soon. Uh, chief investment officer, chief risk officer, perhaps is someone, you know, who's easier to convince. Also trader who trades derivatives, right? You know, if you are basically doing the type of trading that you can see your profit uh, soon, right? You know, you perhaps it's more receptive to machine learning. If you're doing trading in which uh, you don't hold the instrument to maturity, you're basically do doing like things like uh, 30 year swaps, uh, you know, callables or, you know, complex derivatives. Uh, actually, uh, you know, you, you, it's not just, you have to be right, right? You have to be the same as the market. Otherwise you may be right, but you have to wait 10 years in order to realize, uh, you know, to prove that you're right. So it's a function of who you have to convince, you know, specific people or the community. And it, it, we should not forget about this. And that's why what we were talking about, about explainability, convincing that machine learning is here to stay, that that's a valid approach, it, it, I think is extremely important and just as important as being successful and uh, achieving the goal, also convincing people that uh, we've achieved it. All right. I totally so, agree with uh, that. Just perhaps to add one more point is that um, all the, all of these techniques are, I mean, are relatively novel. Everyone's still in kind of heavy research mode. Eventually they'll become sort of the norm. And uh, all, of, all of the techniques that apply to traditional statistical analysis, not only apply to things like deep, deep learning, but are even more important. Such as uh, things such as uh, avoiding backtest overfitting, proper cross validation. Um, once those techniques are in place and are more confident with the models, well, even then it's not a kind of flip of a switch like what happened in 08, um, but it's going to be kind of a gradual kind of paper trading style with a redundancy use, uh, using the older models for redundancy, sort of like the autonomous driving. It's not immediate flip to autopilot. It's, a, it's the driver who, is, uh, who has to hand, hand, have hands on the wheel. And slowly as, as uh, confidence is gained, for some of these more novel techniques and as expertise is built up, I think uh, it's going to be a gradual, pa gradual path to a broader acceptance. Right, yeah, I agree, I agree. All right, so with that, uh, you know, we over on 15 minutes, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's time for, for us probably to be wrapping up. So just before we finish, I just want to remind that that's the end of the main, that's the last event of the main conference. However, there is a two day workshop at two hours each day, Monday, Tuesday, practical machine learning. Uh, so we'll, you know, we'll build some models in Python and uh, run them. Uh, so anybody is interested, uh, free is uh, free to all the conference participants. Uh, the information is, uh, joining information is, uh, has been uh, shared. And uh, just before we finish, Ed, uh, Ed uh, do you have anything uh, else to share from WBS? Any announcements?
Uh, well, no, nothing. Just to obviously thank you, Alexander, and all of our panelists, presenters, and of course our audience that have stuck it out this far. Um, as you've said, uh, this, this, although this is the end of the main body of the conference, you will be running those uh, those workshops on Monday and Tuesday, and you'll get the, uh, the invites to those on Sunday. Um, and as ever, we'll keep our conference portal open at education.wbstraining.com for the foreseeable future, so please do make use of that for files and recordings as well as discussion forums. And of course, WBS doesn't stop here, so please do pop over to our website to see all the other conferences, webinars, and professional development certifications coming down the pipeline. But otherwise, thank you again, and we really do hope to see you all in person in Dubrovnik in November. Thank you. And, and on behalf of all attendees, uh, thank you for organizing a great conference. I think it was a tremendous lineup. Thank you. Thank you. Great discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye.